corner <laughs> when I'm not presenting. Listening in. And listen in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bash University Live here on Tuesday night. Take a quick break. Watch John Cruz's on the Tokyo rig. Be a part of the show. Get some chances to win some awesome prizes. Bash you go. You know, we didn't have that back then. And, 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 dude, it, it can just... That text thread gives me so much energy. I mean, like I'm dialing. Welcome to Bash University Live, everybody. Glad you could be with us here on our Tuesday morning. Um, really uh, a lot of cool stuff happening, as usual, in the Bash University world. And really excited uh, about our, our guest today. He's winner uh, over on the MLF, Hunter uh, Bauman. Um, I keep wanting to say Bowman. Hunter Bauman. Uh, just one amazing individual, amazing accomplishment on Truman Lake uh, Toyota Series event. He, he he just is is truly an exceptional person. He's uh, he has some physical uh, limitations. If you guys have seen his story, it, it's uh, it's really fascinating that somebody with uh, with with dealing with that can be can fish, much less be competitive much less win a dominate a national event it's it's absolutely amazing i can't believe he's can't believe he's going to be here with us yeah i'm looking forward to hearing this story this is going to be a good story for sure cuz we've never actually i don't think covered one like this correct no no yeah, I, I don't think we have yeah, yeah. well it's it's so it's so unbelievably it really spectacular. Is. I mean, this yeah. this does not is not something that occurs uh, very much, you know. Uh, and and we'll have him tell his story. I've read a little bit about it. As a child, uh, he had some medical difficulties, which required some amputation of his of his legs, and uh, he has a, just a couple digits on his right hand, and um, and he's able to to, to function, uh, uh, operate a bass, but be competitive. Uh, think his way and win and win it's just it's just an incredible uh story so we're gonna dive in and and honestly you know all that aside what a really cool strategy he had bash university style as we dive in deep and you know finding isolated habitat that the other guys weren't looking at uh using his forward facing sonar using uh, using his sonar to, to find some pretty unique stuff and uh, and really uh, catch and you know catch fish and win this tournament in a, in in a fantastic manner. So you want to hang in there. It's uh, it's it's an inspirational story for us for us all. Uh, and Hunter is going to be with us here in just a few minutes. So it's uh, a lot going on. We're brought to you by Tackle Direct. We're here in Tackle Direct Studios, and uh, want to invite you guys to check those guys out. Pr amazing pricing. Uh, customer service that is amazing. You will get your baits delivered uh, in a very, very efficient manner. And so go check them out. You're going to like uh, dealing with the folks over at Tackle Direct. And in-house tonight, we, we've got a pretty full house tonight. We may even get a special guest. So you want to hang in there for that, but but we, we shall see. But to my left, GDP uh, with us. Always, always good to have you here. Back again, Pete. Yes. Yes. At the end of the elites, now hopefully we can get you more now that the elites have uh, yeah. come to an end this year. You yeah. Know? If I'm free, I'll be here. Awesome for sure. Well, it's great to have you, and uh, it's good to be here. <laughs> uh, just, just I want to congratulate you because we participated in the Ike Foundation Youth Event this uh, this Sunday, and uh, we had we had difficult conditions, but uh, but you uh, su successfully captained Vegas the Hammer to yet another win. Uh, in his young young career, with a, catching a monster twelve pound bag yep. out there, he's going to be somebody to reckon with in the future. I can tell you that from the first cast, I knew I was like, "Oh, this is going to be good." Yeah, yeah, I, I swear it, it was it was pretty amazing. He fishes like he's seventeen, eighteen year old, eighteen years old. No kidding, he's way ahead of his age. Wow. Yep. Well, how, what was his? Um, 
did he did he spit during the celebration or uh, you <laughs> he, know when he, he caught is, the big one? What, listen, what what did did he get that from from his is, old man? He is complete opposite of Mike. Is that true? <laughs> yes, yeah. calm, cool, and collective. <laughs> Come on. Yep. He, I caught a fish. So he, <laughs> he, he had a he had a, a four and a half pounder on which on this place is a really good one. Yep. And he's fighting it. He's like, yeah, it's not pulling hard, but he's reeling in. He finally sees it. And I'm like, oh, that's a good one, dude. And he's yeah. like, oh yeah, it's a good one. He goes, I'll, I'll, I'll come around real slow. I'm like, right, I'll be here in net. It was just so calm. Put it in there and grab it. He, he grabs it in there. He goes, man, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah. you know, it was just so calm. <laughs> he's like the he's like the been there, done that attitude. Like, yeah. <laughs> like act, act like, like you've been, been there, there before. before. Yeah. And he's just just like, yeah, man, it's just another one. <laughs> he, and he, he he lost one. He puts his arms down. He goes, oh man, that was a good one. <laughs> it, 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 that that was it. And it was right back to the next one. Wow, it, it was good. Boy, that's that's yep. that's mental toughness. That's going to be hard to contend with. <laughs> it was impressive. Yeah, it was. Well, it was really impressive. Now you're dialed in on that body of water, and congratulations on that because it was. I took uh, I took my son Jake and his buddy Tanner out, yep. and uh, and with little help from you, we were able to get a few bites. We uh, Jake caught a short smallmouth, which was a lot of fun. He was st- he's still bummed. He <laughs> wasn't able to weigh that in. He's like, Dad, we should have brought it to the scales. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Stretch the tail. He, yeah, he's, he's like, it's not your call. It's the tournament director's call on whether that's a short fish. <laughs> he, wa- he wanted to bring that to the scale. <laughs> and uh, But it was um, – and, and, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, his buddy Tanner had a real big one on, and, and he lost that one. But uh, – but it was it was a difficult tournament, but it's so such a great event, and I want to invite you guys to go check it out at IkeFoundation.org. There's going to be another series of tournaments next year, so um, if you're if you have kids, uh, Jocelyn, what are, what is the age range? Um, we go anywhere from like five six to up to eighteen until oh, wow. they they need a license or whatever uh, that uh, is. Okay. Um, but I did want to make a note that we are having our annual kayak tournament. So if you're a kayak fisherman. Um, we're having at Lake Noxa Mixon on October second. <laughs> so if you did, I say that Lake Noxa Mixon. That's pretty Mixon. close. Noxa Mixon. Wicker Town. That's yeah. close. Yeah. Um, but we're also, if you sign up, you can uh, buy raffle tickets to buy a t- for a chance to win a Hobie kayak. So, and you could win a Hobie kayak for first place. So, go Very if nice. you're a kayak fisherman, go sign up. Yep. Well, I can tell you, we're going to be back to some some more tournaments. Uh, in the future and Ike Foundation is is an amazing um, group it 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 helps kids get into fishing kids that might yep. never get a chance to go fishing and uh, go you, you can help by going over to ikefoundation.org and you can donate and we will make sure that that money uh, gets some great fishing gear into some kids hands that might not get a chance to do it so a um, a lot of fun. It was awesome that that we were all there. Ike was there as well, and uh, it was a really fun event. And but we're glad to be here. And we have, like I said, we have a full house. Jocelyn, you just heard her. Uh, she's with us as usual. Uh, it's great to have you with us, Josh. What what do we got going on here tonight? What are we giving away here today? Um, so we are giving away for our like and share Facebook contest. Um, if you go to our Facebook feed and like and share, we will give you a Bash University subscription or a subscription extension with a twenty five dollar gift card to Tackle Direct. Nice. Um, for our grand prize, we have a Rappel prize pack. Um, we have a Rappel hat, a Bash University hat that we're sending out, and then an entire I think they're called crankbaits. Oh yeah, <laughs> DT six. Yeah. Awesome. DT6 is all those yep. um, with Hell some BMC hooks along with that as well. So all the goods. Um, pay attention. We're going to do a trivia question. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll ask a question based on Hunter's fishing pattern today, or something that happened on the show. So we're going to test you, Bash University style. And if you win, uh, we got a great gift for you guys. So like, if you're watching over on Facebook, like us, share us, and uh, we'll put you in a in a contest to win the prizes that Jocelyn just talked about and pay attention. And if you are not already a subscriber, I would take advantage of our deal that we have going on right now. You could test Bash University out for a 30 day free trial or a three month subscription with a $25 gift card to tackle direct. So if you haven't tried us out, I would, I would suggest you do. A lot of people are, a lot of people are, you all you deer hunters, this is what you need. You need to subscribe, and you need to be watching Bash University while you're in the stand. That's right. Or listening to it. Put one uh, ear pod in and listen to a seminar. That's it. Listen, listen to the the leaves crackle in one ear, and uh, <laughs> and the Bash University in the other. It'll help your fishing game. It's a great time to get back into it. And uh, and Riz, are you, are you going to be hunting this fall? 
Uh, I don't know, Pete. You know, it's l- last year I, I didn't hunt at all. Actually, you know, it's like it kind of seems like I got to spend more time in the fall and winter doing other things because the summer sp- is the time where it's most of the time spent on the water. So yeah. you know, we'll see though. If I if I get out a few times and you know shoot a couple ducks, it'll be 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 a good time but you know my dog's getting older she's almost 10 or she is 10 now actually so i don't hunt her anymore so uh i don't have as much of a reason to go but you know we'll see i like fishing in the fall yeah the the fall fishing once once the weather starts changing it's you know starts cooling off a little bit can have some fun days out there so we'll be looking forward to that speaking of that i i just was talking with uh with my buddy tim mcglenn who uh who practiced with me for the open but he's fishing the toyota series on messina right listen to this derby day projected wind chill 35 degrees nice <laughs> <laughs> welcome welcome to fall yeah man welcome oh man to, welcome to new york yeah they're, get, they're getting a 20 mile an hour north wind Ooh. and they're gonna they're gonna have wind chills in 35 degrees that's crisp yeah but i love no, thank you ah, i love it i love it get a right. heavy swir- sweatshirt and a windbreaker yep. you are good to go changing of the seasons yep. you get those leaves all the mountains of the, yeah. up there are going to be all oranges and reds and the big Big small mouth will be pushing shallow. Oh my goodness, we're we're leaving for Messina right after this broadcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the the change of seasons, moving into winter, I believe we opened up our ticket window today, right, Jocelyn? We sure did. So we have announced that we are going to Gadsden, Alabama, and Anderson, South Carolina, in January, we're and back. we have opened up our ticket window. And if you're listening right now, we are doing a 25% off early bird special. So I will copy and paste the links into the chat. Um, Sign up. I mean, get it now when it's 25% off. It's early. We can't wait. You know, uh, we're going to be bigger and better than we've been. We got some exciting things planned for this year's classes, and we can't wait to see you guys. It's been a couple of years since we've been able to get face-to-face and belly-to-belly, and uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, You know, like I said, we're going to Gadsden. We're going to South Carolina. We've got some other areas that we're going to be announcing pretty soon, um, and we look forward to that. So we're going to be spreading Bass University around the country. So so come on out and see us and get your tickets now while you can. Uh, one of the guys that spent a lot of time putting these classes together, I see up on our, uh, on our screen. We're glad to have you with us, J- Justin Kimmel, a professional fish head, NPFL angler. Justin, it's good to have you with us today. I almost said tonight. I'm, oh. I'm not used to morning broadcast. It's good to see oh, you, buddy. I love it. I'm so I'm so glad we're here in this season of morning broadcast. Just listening to Jocelyn, I, I, it takes me back. You know, one of our favorite things every year is the classes, right? I mean, traveling around the country, getting to see our Bashu family all over the all over the place. I'm gonna have to make an appearance, man. I, I miss it. It makes oh, just jealous of that season. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm here, getting a break from my jobs here at Kimmel Design Studio, getting to hang out with you guys, taking a break from being the warehouse manager, the uh, <laughs> coffee runner, the janitor, the receiver, and whatever else she wants me to do today. But, I like uh, the janitor. <laughs> I clean up. Oh, we keep it clean around here. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is one of the days that I that I, that I I try to try to help Catherine. Um, but uh, just really glad to be with you guys. Excited to talk to Hunter and go bash you with him. And oh, yeah. uh, got a post panel. Uh, love doing those. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, can't wait to hear what all the pros uh, said and answered. And uh, also can't wait to hear what Pete and GDP and Rich have to say as well. So Awesome. Well, it's great to have you, uh, JK, and look forward to that pros panel. And you guys may – is Scott's mic hot, yep. Riz? But you, hot? You there hear, you go. You hear questions uh, coming in, uh, and this is Scott Carlisle. There you go. You got, hey, we got guys. an image. Of, there you go. of Scott, who <laughs> is uh, awesome. a part of the Bashu family, and uh, it's great to have you with us as well, Scott. Appreciate that. Yeah, looking forward to going down south for those classes. Can we tow the boat down? 
I mean, it's still warm down there when we're teaching, right? So, yeah, do right. it. It's it's time. Al, you know, Alabama. The wa- I I don't believe the waters ever froze. So oh well, you, you just, know, you made my day. All right, <laughs> USS Carlisle is ready to go. All right, <laughs> come on, let's go. Coos the River, nitro <laughs> in tow, baby. <laughs> That's it. Here we come. We're raining down on uh, Alabama and South Carolina. Of course, let's our get it done. Our production studios are now on the banks of Lake Hartwell, which uh, which is awesome. So we're gonna. You, I think we all should just crash Jeff's house, right? We'll <laughs> we'll have the Bash University event, and then we would just we would just crash. Yeah. We don't you know? have to tell him though. No, we'll just show up. <laughs> hey, Dawn, we're here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dawn, and you guys and your seven dogs, we're we're, we're staying for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring some tents, yeah. some campers. We'll figure it out. But uh, it's going to, going to be a lot of fun. So we look forward to seeing all you guys in our classes this year. But uh, yes. we're going to take a quick break, and uh, we're going to br- bring in uh, Hunter Bauman, fresh off of his big win on Lake Truman. Uh, can't wait to talk to him, and uh, he's going to be with us here in just a few minutes right after this. BassBoatForSale.com is the world's premier bass boat listings business. We focus on driving premium web traffic to our main website, business Facebook page, business Instagram, and our business YouTube channel. Providing your bass boat listings the best buying traffic and top-notch exposure. Whether you need to sell your bass boat or are looking to buy a bass boat, it's simple. We give boats exposure so buyers shop and sellers list. One-time listing fee, no commission, and boats list until they sell. BassBoatForSale.com. Check it out. AquaView, the leader in underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for, catch more fish, have more fun. Aquaview. Seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fish and rod? I'm truly losing less fish. It is the sensitivity of the rod. That they're made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick. Every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out doing a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming Series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod i found that can withstand my hooks that boom goes the dynamite. On the water, not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together, the One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Guys, welcome back to Bash You Live. Uh, we have Hunter Bauman coming on, the winner of the Toyota Series on Truman Lake. Uh, just, just an amazing win, amazing accomplishment for anybody, but uh, especially for this gentleman. And um, and Riz, are we are we ready to go? We we are. He's uh right. he's ready to go. I in, see. He's in the in the queue. Let's let's go ahead and bring him on. I see the man, the champ. 
the Toyota <laughs> Series champ, Hunter Bauman, man. Thank you so much for being with us today, man. It's, I'm so excited to, to hear your story. Well, thank you all for having me. I'm tickled to be here. Man, it's uh, it's tremendous. Uh, it, it was a great win, a very, very challenging tournament like they all are in the fall. And, uh, and man, you, you really pulled off a big one. Have you come down off cloud nine yet? Man, I, I don't even think I've been off my phone yet. <laughs> <laughs> this has gone crazy. <laughs> well, you should have been. Now, if you were like me and you fell in, uh, I had the same experience. They're still calling me about falling in on the, on my last tournament, but uh, I wished I'd have got the win. But you you really pulled it off, and it's it's thrilling to get those calls and text messages, isn't it? It is. And I was going to ask you, Pete, if you've been swimming lately. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, you know, like I hey, I was telling these guys, Hunter, it's it's. Uh, it's about public perception. When people look back at this tournament on the Chesapeake Bay, they're going to say, oh, you remember when Pete fell in and won that tournament? And uh, that's what they're going to say, and I promise you I will not correct them. <laughs> whatever, it takes. Uh, whatever it takes. We'll take that win. Yep. But you, right. you legit did win. And, uh, man, it, it, I read through a lot of what took place in that tournament. You had to overcome a, a lot of problems, uh, you know, but you came through it uh, with shining colors, and uh, it was it was a really really a great win fishing in all that brush. It seemed like oh my gosh, it seemed like you were always you know fortunate to be able to have things go your way, like it like it can go wrong when you're fishing in brush piles. Man, for sure, you know I, I've I've had a lot of days where it didn't go your way, you know stuff that you don't even expect it to go your way and and this week or last week it just it went it went my way and for you know just my time i guess because there was three or four instances that those fish never should have come in the boat i mean just just what it is is part of fishing and they did man they they, it's it's sure it sure did and we're gonna i want to dive in and and learn about this because you were uh, uh a couple of them were you know, you had given up. Like, I've been there. You've been there, GDP, yeah. where, like, you're in a brush pile at, for five minutes, and you're like, all right, I'm, I'm not getting this fish. Yep. And that happened to you, and but it it, it, it went your way. Man, for sure. The uh, the second day I had one of those over three, and it you could feel it fighting, and it'd go, you know, three or four feet down in the pile, and you could hear the line make it, and you're like, oh, this yeah. is bad, you know. And then I'd pick it back up, and the line would pop, 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 and get up to the top, and it just it stop. And I did this back and forth long enough. My co went back to the back of the boat and started fishing again. <laughs> and I went like all the way around this thing. Actually, I grabbed the Propel drink out of the uh, ice chest <laughs> right before that, and I had it up there. And I actually just held tension on the line, was drinking the Propel, just trying to let this fish swim out. And I, I said, man, I guess you know, I guess it's not going to work. And about to, I, I started pulling real hard and this fish just like rolled up on its side and floated out of the pile. Oh and then my gosh. The, on the last day, um, about one o'clock I had, well, I guess I had over 17, but uh, I had a two, like a two sixty still in the boat. Another deal. I actually saw a pile. I didn't even know it was there. Saw it on live scope threw in it just immediately. It loaded up. I set the hook and it's one of those fish that never moves. I mean, you, you load up on it and you can feel the head shake, but like it never moves an inch your way. And I thought this one probably not as long, but as I got over the top of it, it, it wouldn't even move. Like I could pick up and feel the limb moving, but I couldn't feel the fish. And I, I assumed the fish had come off at that point. And I actually turned the trolling motor on and thumbed my reel and went to troll away and break the line. And when I did, a four and a half pounder comes jumping out of the pile. Wow. And we get in the net and I call up the 19. And I, ultimately, that, that fish won the turn. Wow. That's, wow. that's, and we've all been there where it doesn't go that way, you know? And, and yes. you, you break off and, uh, you know, you tell, tell the story about the one that got away. But this was not, this was not going to happen to you. You were not going to be denied. Uh, it was, that, that was fantastic. Now we were, uh, we were talking, and, and I'm going to bring in uh, Justin Kimmel to ask a question because you two guys are competitors on the MPFL uh, tournament trail. And, um, of course, Justin's long time been with Bash University. And, Justin, we were talking about, like, the, the brush and, and, like, 
w- how he was finding these isolate. I'll, I'll send it to you to to yeah. ask your question. Yeah, Hunter, man, you know, again, congratulations. Uh, we're you. we're obviously competitors. So when I, I've always known Hunter's great fisherman. You know, he's ha- he's done a lot around the house. You can see the trophy case behind him. And it's not just one trophy sitting there, but. You know, you've got an incredible story. You got, you know, this was an incredible meant to be win, but immediately where my head goes at is how your strategy. Cause I read into something and I'm like, whoa, this is like wizardry stuff here. Like <laughs> I, I fish brush piles and I'm going to assume you got, you fished a lot of brush piles too, uh, being in Arkansas. You know, my trip to Arkansas this year, I fished brush piles at Hamilton and the All American, you know, so I'm, I'm sure you're well versed. But you had a strategy that you let out of the bag, and we're going to dive into it, Bash U style, because I've got to learn. It's you were quoted as saying in practice, you would find the brush piles that I that I assume you assume everybody else is going to find those major brush piles too, and you started to look on the outskirts. You you it said you the article that I read said you were looking for another sixty to eighty yards or something for smaller stumps. And being it being in the fall, half more than half your field was just complaining about being fishing in the fall, you know, like it was that tough this tournament. And you 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 cut through that and found a way to catch bigger fish. So I really wanna want want you to tell us about this strategy. Like what what were you doing here? And like were you catching bigger bites, you know, or was it just extra bites that you know, other guys weren't going to spend the time on. Um, you know, so I, the first day I spent going up the creeks, I'll start with that and got a few bites, but gosh, that place is like miserable to get around. It was low. It's just like going through the woods. I mean, there's stumps <laughs> everywhere. So, and I kind of had on my mind, I wanted to do the brush pile thing, but the first day of practice I spent up the creeks, I actually saw a couple of piles while I was fishing. I caught a keeper out of boat. So that kind of solidified, man, I want to do this brush pile deal. So then I narrowed it down to near the ramp where there's not as much timber, so I don't have to spend the time trying to – well, I feel like a brush pile is better if it doesn't have timber all the way around, if it's isolated. So I got on the flatter stuff. Well, I looked at both, but the flatter stuff seemed to have more bites. So I got on the flatter stuff, and I, I would graph, and I had two or three stretches of bank that I had big brush piles down. And um, then I went back with my live scope. And I just and and I'll be honest, I'm a river fisherman. I'm a shallow water guy. Before the the four facing sonar craze, man, I hated brush piles because I'd roll up, make three throws, never hit it, and be like, "This is the stupidest thing in the world." And I'd leave. But now that I can see them and watch my bait follow them, it's like flipping. Like I I love the flip. It's just like deep water flipping. You throw up there, watch your bait go in the pile, not seeing the fish, but you can you know you can watch your bait. So I went back and I started. I was fishing anyway because I was checking them. And the second day of practice, I shook like 25 bites out of piles. I'm like, man, this is the deal. I'm committed to it. So I would troll, you know, the piles might be 100 yards apart. Well, I would troll with the live scope in between them and look for any piece of wood. And I'd make throws. And a lot of times there wouldn't be a bite. Every, every once in a while there would be. But what that gave me was the opportunity to go down a bank, say, eight or 900 yards long, whatever, and fish the whole way down. it. I'm not having to idle from pile to pile. I'm not having to. Troll from pile to pile. There was a few instances where I'd pick up a buzz bait or a spinner bait and just take off till I got to my next waypoint. I never caught a keeper doing that, but I, I didn't want to just kill time. Um, but it gave me all these little little bitty specific pieces of wood I could throw at. I'm sure some guys could see that stuff on the side scan. Actually, I'm not that good at it. It takes live scope for me to be able to see that little bee stop that's down there. Um, so that, that just – it, it gave me opportunity to be able to just get on the bank and go instead of hopping and wow. spend more time making more throws in practice. I shook some fish doing that. It didn't produce just, it, it did not actually produce my three biggest fish The two over four and the one over five all came out big piles. Um, but it produced several of those three, three and a half pound fish that, that kind of made the difference on your average. Uh, and okay. a matter of fact, on day two, I had two stumps way, like I'd marked them way out off the end of this point And I'd, I had a hundred piles, you know, in three days of practice or hundred, hundred waypoints. And so you forget, like I try to mark them and, and categorize them, but you don't. And I saw those stumps. I'm like, man, I, I think those were pretty big stumps that were isolated. And I went out there and those actually held 
really quality fish. I could see those on the line scoping up, pulled up, but it, it was just, just the ability to be able to just move down the bank and, and fish more pieces of wood as I went. That's, that's amazing. I want to, I want to jump in who we interviewed the winner of Lake Champlain who was fishing off of his forward facing sonar, Kyle Hall, Kyle Hall. And the, he comes from Texas. They learned, um, just what you're saying that the the important or what forward facing sonar is allowing you to do is to fish in between brush piles mm. or in between rock piles and catching winning fish doing that yep. because most guys are just running and gunning from brush pile to brush pile but folk but that allowing you to find habitat and fish on the in between places are fish that we've never caught before correct is that are you yes. are you dialed into that? Yes. Have you used that this year? Hundred percent. Really? Yep. Give me give me an example. Like, uh, so where we were the other day, I did it. But this year, Union Lake. Yeah. This year at Pickwick, I was doing it. Right. You know, in between there at Pickwick, I had two different areas. I was doing the same thing. Yeah. In practice, I literally was just trolling better up into the next little dip up there. In between, I saw them and I fished in between in the tournament because I saw them in practice. Yeah. But I've been doing it now for over a year. Exactly what he just said. It's kind of like a. One thing you don't want to get out there thing. Yeah. But obviously, he just won a big tournament doing it. It's a second one. We've, we've, yes, exactly. This and, year. And there's probably been a handful more that just haven't been talked about, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, right. um, it's definitely some, I think it's a, I think it's a sneaky pattern is what it is. It's, it's the in betweener. I don't know what you want to call it, but it's a, it's something that there's, there's a population of fish that I, I believe don't set up traditionally as the masses do, is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to tell you. And right. what he was doing. I have a, I have a question for you, uh, Hunter. Was there – was there? It, it just seems like it's more of a fall thing. That's why I'm asking this. Was there an actual depth that a lot of the fish seem to be in as far as population-wise, the fish you were catching? Or were they across five the board to, scattered? Uh, five to 15. Everything I caught was five to 15, which is a big range. That's a big range. Okay. The last day I had a one over five out of five feet of water and one over four out of 15 feet of water. So Okay. And on, but I never – Oh, go ahead. On, on Truman, was the, was the bait basically from that five to fifteen, or what was kind of like the deal going on there? Yes, there was a lot of bait in that range, and even if you got out deeper, you know, I noticed even if you were in twenty or thirty, that that bait was still in that five to fifteen range. Okay. Same line. Yep. Uh, one thing, I, the reason I asked this is because one thing I have noticed so far with four facing sonar is it allows you to really dial in the depth range of the fish a lot of time is because like if there's a big concentration of bait 10 feet your population of bass will be in 10 feet and you know the way things are nowadays you can just set your graph to go to you know 9 to 12 and keep you in that range and that's kind of where you're focusing most of your time at right. that's why i asked that question because in the fall it seems like it once the fall sets in and they're down south so it's probably not as dramatic as up here right now but once that fall sets in that bait gets to that depth and bass are right there for them right right you know? Well, I love the new uh, I love the new term in betweeners, yeah, in -betweeners. hunters <laughs> catching them in betweeners. <laughs> <laughs> bonus fish, bonus fish. Yeah, they were definitely bonus fish. Yeah, for sure, thirty thirty some thousand dollars worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Hunter, I want to ask too about you know your approach. You you have applied your shallow. You just admitted to being a shallow water river rat, right? Um, Absolutely. And you you just took your style. To forward facing you you didn't try to go be you know dustin connell or patrick walters with a jerk bait and you know the all the other hot forward facing sonar baits you you did it with kind of your bread and butter butter and you set it right there you just decided you're flipping it just takes a little bit longer for your bait to get to the bottom tell us about the baits because i know you had two different sizes of jigs and one surprised me, and I, and I want you to talk about the efficiency, especially of that heavier one, and how that handled the brush. But talk to us about those baits. So I, I've used a 5 16 finesse jig and then a three-quarter football. And really, I had a rock pile I'd found, and the finesse jig really was primarily on that. Sorry, did I lose you? My phone's ringing. <laughs> yeah, it happens all the time, Hunter. You're back. You're back. Good job. Well handled well, just like the there tournament man. win. You just handling everything. Smooth, man. This guy's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, that one rock pile, it wasn't like 
great or anything. The first day, I think I had three keepers off of it, and then maybe two the second day, and one the third. So, but it was it was very easy to be hung. So I I, I primarily threw the finesse jig on it. Now the finesse jig is that color. That finesse jig is my deal. Like that is my confidence bait. I have a rod and reel dedicated to it. It's on the deck every time my boat goes in the water. So I had that just kind of a backup. But the three quarter, for whatever reason in practice, I, I shook some on the finesse. I shook some on a shaky head with a baby brush hog. And then I I got the three quarter out and I cut a hook off of it. And I started throwing in and I felt like the bites were quicker. That is efficiency, like you said, J.K., and uh, and and we know that, that that speed in the fall especially gets those fish that are hard to trigger, um, making that making that bait rip past their face a little bit faster. A lot of times, trigger strikes. We've seen it before. It seems like that was an a, effective uh, weapon for you. So you you had a a, a five sixteenth ounce finesse and a three quarter ounce. Uh, jig what 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 would you say the three quarter ounce dominated your catch i would just because i threw it more yeah the big one last the biggest fish i caught all week i caught on the finesse but i actually was hung with the in five feet with the the uh three quarter and i went to get it and i looked at the the forward facing and, and there was a fish that swam through the pile and i stopped the boat i mean i'm almost on top of this i mean it it's shallow and I dropped the poles and I immediately break off the, the foot. That is that is unbelievable. You did get hung a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do what? So you did just get hung a lot because I was about to say what three quarter ounce jig is just coming through all this brush, but Man. you just had a bunch of jigs. <laughs> I, yeah, and I've wild. actually got these fifty a day. <laughs> I don't know if you can see them. I can show you these two jigs, but yeah, I re-spool my two jig rods every night because I'd use a whole spool line tie retying every day, but. <laughs> That's, oh my goodness! Uh, I, I see. I, I I'm visualizing a new business. You know, like the guys that go collect golf balls, uh, the, <laughs> from the golf course ponds. You know, at a Truman, you go to the brush piles. You can you stock a store full of jigs. It sounds like. Man, my boat was probably five mile an hour faster by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so that's so awesome. Um, this hey, this brings up another point. I'm sorry to butt in, but Pete. And Hunter, the patience, because I've talked to some other, I've talked to some Bash UTV subscribers that finished in the top 10. Everybody was complaining about being at Truman in September. Everybody was complaining about how tough it was. Dude, no, and there are not very many people, and I fish brush piles a ton, that are willing to keep at it, going through as many jigs as you did. The patience that your game plan took, took – I mean, it takes a special person, dude. And obviously, you are that special person this week. So, props to the patience. I appreciate it. Patience is key, and uh, especially that time of year. But I, I want to uh, send it over to Jocelyn. I know we've got a lot of people watching at Bash U, and uh, they've got some questions for you, Hunter. We sure do. Um, CJ would like to know, Hunter, did you fish the edges of the piles first or did you go straight in on your first Great cast? Great question. Go for the hero cast or did you work your way in? Hero cast, right? <laughs> I'm in almost on the first throw. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, it that's the, the strategy. You, go, you go right in with that heavy jig 
and look for that reaction strike right out of the gate. I, I, I never did, other than that one five-pounder, like I, I never – saw the fish you'd see some crappie but i never could see the fish so i didn't ever think they were around the edges i felt like and i mean i was fishing in the same i don't know about the, the same area i think some of the same piles as a couple of top 10 rank rank the one that led going into the third day I, I know i was around him some i was around casey's candling some so i don't know if that helped just going right in the middle but i man two throws two throws in a pile and i would move on because it was either going to happen or not like almost always on your first throw Man, that is efficiency right there. That definitely keeps you moving. Yes. That's yeah, a great question. Uh, what, what else you got, Josh? Stefan would like to know, do you target the population of fish that you are doing something different in every tournament? Do I? So do you target the population of fish that are doing something different than during like every tournament? Looking uh, for uh, look, looking for that that pattern that is off the beaten path. What's that? In betweeners. The in betweeners. <laughs> I spend way way too much time in practice on tournaments. A lot of times looking for something to get away from the boats and fish for fish that hadn't been fished for. Most of the time it doesn't work, and you end up doing what everybody else is doing. <laughs> I agree. But but you know, and then you do it with less practice because you've spent forever looking for something different. Man, in Florida last year. Gosh, I, I don't know how far, which I'm an Arkansas River, just backwaters, and we got to Florida, and I idled. Like, I spent three quarters of my practice looking for a group of fish that nobody had found, and all I did was waste a bunch of gas. But that's, that's how I practice a lot of times. You kind of know, to me, generally, you know what that, that prominent pattern will be. Mm -hmm. So you can look for something different. If it doesn't work, then you just have to kind of figure it out during the tournament. I, I have a, a phrase. Sometimes you got to just fish where the fish are at. And uh, that means you're fishing around the other competitors, too. Uh, we just uh, – the the Chesapeake uh, uh, underwater scuba tournament I just fin fished in, we all we all were fishing close around brush piles. And uh, it's, it's odd. You were fishing close to the launch ramp around brush piles, too. Uh, I want – you know, I wonder if that's a survival tactic to win tournaments this time of year. So – Question about that. On Truman, is that the main ramp that most of the tournaments go out of where you guys went out of? So that's know? not where we went out of, but I think a lot of tournaments mm, go out of that yeah, ramp. Yeah. And I'm a big believer in release fish, especially tough fisheries. Arkansas, yeah. I love Arkansas death. I wouldn't live anywhere else, but it's one of the toughest states I've ever been to to catch a fish or keeper fish. And, you know, release fish play a big role, and I, I try to use that. I always look for, you know, the, the main release areas and places because – Man, there's one thing about a release fish. It's going to be a keeper. There's no way around it. If it was way in, it's a keeper. <laughs> That's true. That's and, true. and it's a biter. It's yeah. a keeper and yeah, it's, it's right. a biter. They all, yeah. they all weigh the same. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Two great two great uh, 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 tributes <laughs> of a fish we want to see. Jocelyn? Would um, Tuck would like to know, Hunter, do you finesse? Like finesse. <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I, so uh, when I joined the MPFL last year, we were going north, and oh, here comes another call. You're good. Dude, yeah, you're, you're too yeah, popular, back, Hunter. You're just too popular. <laughs> um, last year, signed up for the MPFL. Was going north. Had never been north, and the only spinner rod I owned was a crappie rod. So I had to go buy a couple spinner rods for the northern swing, but I try to avoid it at all costs <laughs> if I can. Hey, back back to that three quarter ounce jig. I don't know if you discussed it. What what? kind of line because you had to bully some of those fish out were you yeah what's your diameter and fluorocarbon what, what are you throwing it was just 17 fluoro okay 17 fluoro was breaking them limbs and bringing them four and a half pounders out of there that's pretty awesome yeah i man i, I started to go up and i, I really like 17 for dragon i flipped 25 but you know just for dragon i'd, I'd rather have 17 it's a little more limber and I, i've never had any problems with it so i never went up there there you that go works. there you go well that's uh man it's a great win a great strategy and uh and and this is a huge win and and hunter i, I just want to give you an opportunity to to talk about this because this to i guess the whole world uh, you know just listening to your interview might not know that Man, you're you're you've overcome more obstacles than any any other fisherman on the planet. Uh, 
virtually and to, to just be able to fish, to be able to compete, but actually win, uh, man, oh man, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment. I think you're a hero, uh, to many, many people watching this. Oh, I appreciate that very much. <sighs> These people, <laughs> okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, man, you know, I had bacterial meningitis at nine months old. I lost both legs below the knees. I lost all my fingers on my left hand. I've got partial fingers on my right hand. I am in a wheelchair. Uh, I'm able to walk on my knees. I don't use a chair in the boat or anything. I get around pretty good. I just say I'm shorter than everybody else. But, <laughs> you know, um, growing up, I didn't know any other way. Like I don't remember before I was sick, obviously, at that age. And so I, I didn't know any different. So I just – you learned how to do something one way, and I learned how to do it another. I'm very competitive. Like, I'll burn $200 of gas to win $50 in a tournament. I mean, it's just <laughs> what it is. Like, you um, would do great on the and, Delaware River, man. Yeah, like that's, you, you'd be right there with us. <laughs> so, you know, I, the tournaments fit my style. Uh, my family was a crappie fishing, you know, meat fisherman family. Grew up fishing my whole life, hunting my whole life. Somewhere in my early teens, I got into tournament fishing a little bit. I thought it was pretty cool and eventually made some money doing it. And I thought that was really cool. And, you know, I, I played, I wore artificial legs for a little while. I played basketball and soccer through school. The legs weren't for me. They hurt. I wasn't stable. I wasn't competitive playing those sports. So, but I felt like I could be competitive in a boat. So I pursued that as I graduated, started more in the, the Bass Weekend Series uh, at the time and then the, the BFLs. Uh, fished a couple of Everstarts, got my teeth kicked in. But, you know, just slowly built and, and tried to tried to just see what I could do. And then at some point, I, there's a circuit here in Arkansas called Mr. Bass of Arkansas. It's similar to a BFL. It's I, by far the toughest tournament to win in the state of Arkansas. It's an individual deal. Won one of those about five or six years ago and, and really thought, man, I might be able to make a career out of this. The NPFL has given me an opportunity the last couple of years to make a name. Uh, the first time I fished with the NPFL, I actually <laughs> they put a camera in my boat the first day. I was a nervous wreck. And I caught them. I caught them really good. I was in eighth after day one. Got the camera again. Caught them again. And uh, the world – Learned a little bit who Hunter was then. Fell a little bit on the last day, finished in the 20s. But, but you know, I've wanted to make this a career for a long time. I feel like I'm finally getting some traction in the last few years with it. And it's uh, it's just, man, I love it. I love everything about it. I was, I did another little interview for the paper earlier today, and I was telling them, uh, I guess two years ago, I fished 69 tournaments. Like, I just love tournaments. I'm going to go fish in PFL. When I come home, I'm going to fish Toyota. I may fish a twenty-five dollar team tournament, but I'm going. I mean, I'm going to fish for. I hunt in the winter, but for you know about nine months, I'm going to fish a tournament at least once a week somewhere. That's awesome. You you have it just like the the rest of us. It's in your blood, yep. and uh, and you you found a way to to enjoy it. Be be competitive, man. And I that's it's it's and so win. and win and win. It's so impressive. Do do you like? What modifications are there? Do you have any modifications on your boat to like operate your troll motor or operate the outboard? No, I don't. Obviously, I don't have a hot foot. Um, you yeah. know, a hand throttle for the outboard. On the trolling motor, I keep a plate down there so the the uh, pedal is not recessed. And what I do with keep that pedal level with the deck, like old school. And I use my knee and I actually put it under the the back of the pedal and I can push up on it to go right and i push down on it to go left um when the ultrax I, I run ultrax it just fits me better but when it came out it's got the constant button down there on the back the corner of it which works well for me i use that button like you'd use the button on top of the pedal you know i just with my knee i'll hit the constant button and uh, i'll yeah. run the control motor and hit it again when i'm on golf yeah that well that makes sense yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense now now the um rods and reels like uh i mean like, I, I teach guys, like, you know, if you're long and thin, like uh, KVD, you might want to mimic his hook setting style and use gear that he uses. If you're if you're short and long, shorter arms, you you know, you kind of want to buy and use the gear of guys like that. How, how, have, 
How have you had to modify? I mean, are are you able to get those power hook sets? What have you been able to do to modify your, you know, physically to just really be able to drive that hook? Uh, I've got a pretty good hook set. I've got good upper body strength. I'm lacking the the whole body movement sometimes on the hook set because I'm not standing. You know, I'm sitting on a butt seat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I like a little bit heavier rod. Probably my my cousin, my partner that fishes with me around here when he flips with my rods, he likes to break fish off because, you know, I keep a pretty heavy rod, but, um, you know, like the, those fish, I use a Denali rod and those fish in the, uh, in the piles, I was throwing a, a seven, eight extra heavy. It's got a good tip on it, but it was able to, you know, power them back out and have a good hook set. But I, I like, you know, over seven feet helps. Little short rods don't have a lot to it. I got you. Well, it's, it's, uh, I saw so I saw you bowed up on some of those <laughs> some of those images on uh on the website man it, it looked like you weren't having any trouble at all keeping pressure on those fish no not at all man well it's uh, for guys that you know uh do you have any uh, advice or words or, for guys that you know might want to try this sport that have uh, dealing with some things like you've dealt with uh you know, because, I mean, you're a hero to people watching. You're, you're, you're my hero to watch you excel like this. Um, what, what, what can you say to other guys that might be having some difficulties about, you know, getting in the fishing game? Man, everybody is so different. You've just got to figure it out. You know, I, I have guys ask me how I get my boat, and I never really think about it because I just step on the fender and jump in. But, you know, somebody else in a chair that's paralyzed or whatever can't just jump in. But everybody, you can figure out your way. You have to, you have to kind of figure it out yourself. But just don't give up. And it's boring sitting at the house, obviously. So you know, figure out a way to do it because you can do it one way or the other. You can do it. It may take more work, but it's, it's like anything else. You know, I, I do some, uh, I speak to different groups and stuff, and I spoke to some football teams. It's like, how bad do you want it? You know, right? Do you want it bad enough to be practicing when the team's not practicing? Or do you want just bad enough to go to practice every once in a while? Because if you're just halfway, you're not going to be the guy starting the show. But if you want it, you can be the guy. Great advice for for anybody. And, Serious uh, stuff right there. Yeah, it's it's powerful and yeah. it's inspirational. Got to keep that kind of mentality in mind. Like when stuff goes wrong on the water, like even just like equipment wise, like, like, like when you fall in, like yeah, live like on fall in live, live on FS1. You know what I mean? On a on a Saturday morning where there's a lot of people watching. <laughs> no, but I mean like stuff like so like in a day, say where your trolling motor cord breaks, right? Yeah. Or, or like that happened to you, and yeah. or your steering cables break, oh, yeah. or your uh, or your your steering sensor in a trolling motor, or just one of the other million things that can go wrong like in in a tournament day, like how bad do you want it, right? Like, are you out there? Are you on the water? Do you have fishing rods in the boat with you? Are you around fish, right? The answers to all those things are yes. So it comes back to how bad do you really want how it? Bad you want and it. How, how are you going to adjust, right? Like, Pete, you told me something, I think it was it was two years ago, two or three years ago when I, I just about ripped the motor off my boat. You're like, well, this is your new normal for a few <laughs> weeks. Like, <laughs> this is your new normal. Yeah. You got to adjust to it. And, you know, if you want it bad enough and you you really, you know, think about, okay, this is my new scenario, you just, you, you make those adjustments and you keep fishing. But it's, uh, you know, keeping things in perspective. When, when you see something like, Hunter, what you've accomplished, it really should make us all not, you know, resort to making excuses about certain things, right? Because... We have all the tools necessary. As long as we're on the water, as long as we got a rod and reel, you know, you can still make it happen if you want it bad enough. So as as Hunter as Hunter has proved. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And the you know, it's like it's funny you say I, I picked a new line that I'm using uh from like the Apollo thirteen movie where <laughs> Where you know everything went, they're running out of oxygen. They're cir- they got no heat. They're cir- everything's broken down, and and it's like status is like, all right, what is working? <laughs> Let's <laughs> what and and it, and that's man, that's fishing, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like always, you know, you're gonna you're gonna fry a circuit, you know, blow a fuse, you're gonna you know, break your trolling motor shaft yeah. or rip your lower unit off. 
Uh, it's just a necessary part of, of competing, but you have to try to overcome those obstacles. So you can concentrate on what is working, right, right. Hunter? Right. <laughs> That's right, man. Y'all know this fishing isn't a glamorous thing at all. I mean, I rolled out of the tournament, won the tournament, went straight to the gas station, put air in my tire because it was flat and I want to go home. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, especially there, there's so many things you can do in life, but especially this fishing deal, if you're going to make it work, it's, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I mean, I figured out how to do a lot of things, but gosh, I mean, it's not an easy deal. And if you, you see so many guys burn out or think they want it till they get in the middle of it and they don't want it, you know, and it takes a very select few that want it to be able to do this full time. Well, it's it's impressive what you're doing, and uh, you're going toe to toe with our Justin Kimmel over there in the MPFL. Who's going to win the Angler of the Year race between you two guys this year? <laughs> Probably not me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I I feel like Hunter's got me a few times. I might have got him this la last time on Erie, but I, th I think I I don't know where you're at. I honestly looked the other day. And I'm in 25th. I think Hunter's really not far off if he's in front he might be in front no i but, think uh, i actually think i'm in the 40s i'm just consistent enough to be like the only guy in the top 60 hadn't met yet like i have not cut it i don't know what my deal get is out. dude i'm not and I, I did that i was telling somebody i did that in the bfl one year i finished like 10th in the points and never cut a check i mean it's just like i've got really good consistency i don't have bombs it just needs to be a little bit higher of consistency <laughs> Well, you, you, you've got a reason to have, to be a, in a lot better mood about that. Um, I've been there before. I, I think I finished like 16th in the standings one year in the BFLs and never cut a check that year. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, wow, I had a really good year. Just like almost a really, really good year. You know, it's <laughs> like you feel like you fish good tournaments and you're a spot out every time. Mm. Man, well, it's we're, we're going to be watching it close, Hunter. I, I, I see you're active on social, and uh, if people want to follow the the rest of your tournament season, that, how can they do that? Man, Hunter Bogman fishing across all socials, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and I try to hashtag Hunter fishes under everything, so you could probably just look up Hunter fishes and find whatever you want to find. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Say your last name because I think I've been saying it wrong, Hunter. <laughs> Bogman. Bogman. Uh. Yes. Yes, sir. My bad, Pete. Yes. They all to... have been saying it bad. Yes. Bog. I'm blaming I'm blaming Luke Duncan because he was I was going off of how he pronounced it on MPFL. So come on, Luke. We can blame Luke on everything. That's all right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Well that's it, that's been amazing. So so what is next for you? Are you you have a few MPFLs left? Uh what what's what's the next derby? Uh, I've got a team championship on Bull Shoals, North Arkansas, and then we've got MPFL in Florida in November. And I've got another daughter that will be here November 21st. What? So, oh, congratulations. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I, I'll make it quick. Uh, I don't know if y'all heard um, or have ever heard the story, but last year my daughter, my wife went into labor during National Anthem the first morning in Florida of the MPFL, and I got on a fish for like an hour to like get a plane. <laughs> Flew home. She had the baby the next morning. I got on a plane, flew back, and fished the last day of the tournament. And man, she's gonna she's due like two weeks after we're gonna be in Florida this time. So I'm <laughs> going for a repeat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we're gonna have to discuss your wife's schedule. You got to get this dialed in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really. Maybe she's doing it on purpose. She just misses her man. That's what it is. <laughs> she wants him home. Well, well, congratulations oh, on the 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 one about to be, and uh, going to welcoming welcoming a new one into the world. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I saw images of you with your little one. Uh, it's it's just gr it's great to see it. You're an inspiration to all. Congratulations on a great win, and thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. The champ. Hunter Bogman, yes. the Toyota Series champ. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. all That's awesome, man. What a what what an incredible win, man! And uh, that was my favorite interview in the last three years. Yeah, yeah. seriously, that yeah, was awesome. Yeah. yeah, he he is awesome. Yeah. Just you know, yeah. full, full. You know what I forgot to ask him is if he can tie the FG knot. 
because I can't tie that freaking <laughs> thing. And I'm going to be mad if he if he he's figured out it. how to do it. I would have got it. <laughs> that was uh, that was awesome. That's real really cool stuff. Oh, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah, we can we can take a quick break and then we'll, we'll come, come back and we got a great pros kick panel. It old yeah, with with Justin Kimmel, we're going to be talking with a uh, talking about fall fishing patterns and uh, can't wait to to dive in there. So we're going to take a quick break. If you're watching on Facebook, like us and share us, and we got a prize for you as well as we're going to have a great uh, uh, grand prize on something that Hunter talked about today. So uh, if you're paying attention, make sure to tune in for that. We'll be right back after this. BassBoatForSale.com is the world's premier bass boat listings business. We focus on driving premium web traffic to our main website, business Facebook page, business Instagram, and our business YouTube channel, providing your bass boat listings the best buying traffic and top-notch exposure. Whether you need to sell your bass boat or are looking to buy a bass boat, it's simple. We give boats exposure so buyers shop and sellers list. One time listing fee, no commission, and boats list until they sell. Bassboatforsale.com. Check it out. Aquaview, the leader in underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for, catch more fish, have more fun. Aquaview. Seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fishing rods? I'm truly losing less fish. It is the sensitivity of the rod. That's are made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick. Every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out doing a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming Series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod I've found that can withstand my hooks set. Boom, goes the dynamite. On the water, not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minkota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together, the One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Welcome back to Bash University Live. We're just talking off the air. Like run, and we often are running away from the fish, trying to find that elusive uh, secret spot. We all want to fish that way. We all want to fish where they're mm. unencumbered by other anglers. And uh, but the, the you know, glory. We want to find the glory. We want to find the glory. But in particular, in those really really tough tournaments, yep. that the taking that simple approach, fishing the community holes. Uh, seems to be the recipe for winning. Right, I would agree. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about last night, like how many times, like in the like super tough events, like I'll 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 find some fish over here, kind of find some fish over there, but neither of them are like real good. And then I'll either resort back to exactly what you just said, where it's like stay right where you know everything is, or like I'll find myself going to an area that like I maybe only got one bite in practice because it's still unknown. You know, and you go to where you have that one bite, everything's kind of still new. You don't really know what's going on. 
And if you figure it out as the day goes, that's when you really have those special days in a tough event because you figured something out that other people haven't. But right, well, know. see, sometimes that that's that's fact. You know, you get that one bite, right, and it and it gives you just enough of a clue, and, right, and other guys missed it, right. You know, right. But it's those tough tournaments. It's about survival in the open. Uh, here on the Chesapeake, I, you know, I fished a lot of community stuff. You know, just because I. I, it was so challenging uh, yeah. that I felt like I'm going to put myself in the highest percentage areas, and uh, and of course it you know it, it did fairly good for me. And JT, who won the tournament, of course, he I don't think he started his outboard, but for about five minutes, yeah. you know, in that event. So uh, yes, yeah, interesting stuff. But but we have an interesting topic. We challenged you with this, Justin. Uh, we haven't had you a, a, with a pros panel for a while. And uh, we like your Kimmel design uh, banner in the background there. And, um, but it's glad, we're glad to have you here, and I know you've reached out. What, what do you got in store for us for the pros panel today? Yeah, so we're, we're going to talk some fall fishing, man. Like, uh, like it's been referenced even today. Like, man, fishing in the fall is awesome, and it's because all those people are hunting. Football's big in, you know, in certain areas. Like, you, you – you just get the fish to yourselves for a little bit. They get kind of a break if they're not under ice, you know, later in the year. But, man, the fall feeds on uh, in a lot of different parts of the country. But I, I wanted to ask our panel of pros a question that's based on their location, okay? This is going to be a middle of fall, think mid to late October, early November, like the 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 crux of the fall. Um that's when it starts getting get good. Before. That's when it makes the change around here. That's when we go from uh, being tough to starting to get a little better. That's right, man. And, 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 and when you hear these pros, and I'll try to mention, you know, kind of their home lakes or where they're from so that you know. Like, I wanted an answer based on where they're from, their local, you know, lakes. Because we could get a general answer, and that could help some people, but – I wanted to get pros from around the country and from different parts so that we could get different answers um, and then see if we can find a pattern in it. You know, you know, let's see, let's see, you know, what, what we can. So let's, let's, let's start with the question. It's the middle of fall and your local lake, you know, thinking your local lake just got a ton of rain. Where are you going to catch them and what are you going to catch them on? I wanted to ask this because every now and then we get a bunch of rain in the fall, tropical storm comes up, you know, the whole East coast or a hurricane, or we talk about rain in the spring because it's expected, right? A lot of times. Well, now it's dip change in seasons. What, what, what are we thinking with a ton of rain in your local lake, Pete and GDP, Riz be thinking about this. Where are you going to catch them? And what are you going to catch them on? So we're going to start with uh, our pal Jordan Lee. Uh, he's more of a, a a Smith Lake local these days. I think that's where his answer probably came from. Um, you know, Highland Reservoir, a lot of spotted bass, um, largemouth too. And his answer surprised me a little bit, but he said, I would expect the fish not to be loaded in the runoffs or where fresh water is coming in. I would concentrate on wood if I'm in dirtier water, but would also almost ignore the water coming up and fish the deeper fish. He said, mm. the deeper fish, I'm going to use the jerk bait, the Mickey rig minnow, a little finesse swim bait, an Alabama rig. He said, they're going to be concentrated on the fall feed. And if the water is dirty everywhere or in the backs of the run-ins and creeks, it could have them pushed up a little bit shallower than normal. But if it's still clear, he's going to look at where the fish are on bait and find where the bait is out deep. The water's coming in in fall usually doesn't concentrate fish like it does in the spring. So he, he's saying it doesn't concentrate like it does in the spring where he's at. I don't love that fresh mud either just because water temp is about the same. Very... <laughs> That was a very good answer. A lot of uh, <laughs> a lot longer than some of the answers that we got, but we appreciate Jordan. Um, That's a great his... answer. I mean, just to just to comment on it, and the one thing to take away, and I think this you might hear this a lot, is 
that where the bait is. I mean, it's so key, you know, uh, identifying that where the bait is concentrating. Because mm-hmm. as you get into the fall and winter, man, if you're not fishing where those where that bait is, man, you're you're just out of out of the loop. Yeah, thank so you. True. And I, thank you, Jay. I Lee. learned that lesson the hard way, man. I I, I remember the Hartwell Open, Bassmaster Open. It was the first open I fished on the butter side. Patrick won it, and he won it offshore. And the the top ten was all offshore. And two weeks prior, I was smoking them up shallow on a bluegill bite, like unreal weights. And we got the water level raised two and a half to three feet, I think, in like 10 days. And, you know, I mean, I moved off too, but like just I kept wanting to go shallow. And I learned that lesson at least on those kind of Hartwell or the Highland Herring Lakes. Uh, the deeper fish seem to be more stable. Um, so I asked my running mates, my my, my roommates, um, we'll start with Patrick. You know, he he's – just bought a new house on uh, on Santee Cooper now, so he's living on the lake now. He said he's taking a spinner bait and going into the back of the biggest creek with his trolling motor on blast. So he's just going to cut cover water in the biggest major creek. Um, wow! Right in the face of the flow, he's doing it. Mm-hmm. He's opposite. He's getting in there. I like it. Yeah, wants that dirty water. Um, By the way, Patrick, we'll, we'll be uh, seeing you for the Bash University meetup on Santee Cooper. Uh, we look forward to staying at your new house. <laughs> awesome. Yes. <laughs> Come on, book it. <laughs> uh, so uh, Trent, my other roommate, Trent Palmer, fishing in PFL, coming off two top tens in a row, two top sixes, really. Um, you know, he's a Lanier local, so this was a, a Lake Lanier answer, you know, Spotted bass, kind of similar to, it's kind of similar to Smith where Jordan's come from. But Trent's staying on spots, and he said he's going to the bank on main lake fish, and he's going to crank main lake rock when that happens, when when, he, when the rains come and, and stuff. He's going to grab a crankbait and just cover as much rock on the main lake uh, that he can. And if you probably get a little wind or current, that's probably what he's going to chase. Um, big fish, Bobby Lane, uh, our pal down, down in Florida. Um, we're going to be filming, uh, with big fish, Bobby Lane next week. So look for some, uh, awesome. some great, uh, on water training and teaching coming from Bobby real soon. That's awesome. I wish I could go on that trip cause I'll be in his neck of the woods <laughs> at the Kissimmee <laughs> chain next month. Um, so Bobby, uh, he said this, that's the time of year. It's prime time for shallow fish to start feeding. If you get a bunch of rain, it immediately puts oxygen in the water and cools off the shallow water. He said, I'm, I'm going to put my trolling motor on somewhere between 50 and 70 and cover as much water as possible, throw in a Chapo 105. That's the mid-sized version of, of uh, Berkeley's Chapo. Um, he said they should bite all day long. You're not going to catch very many in one spot, spot and they'll be spread out. So he's going to cover water and pick off one here, one there with the, with the plopper. Love that. Chop. Love that difference. The, the Florida water oh, is yeah. getting cooled off yeah. and it's a good thing, yeah. you know, yeah, it's a good thing <laughs> <laughs> compared to, compared to our part of the country where it, it can be a, a detriment late in the yeah. fall. So Nick Hatfield, our, our fellow, Bash you friend, rookie of the year on the Tackle Warehouse Tour this year. Uh, I think you guys had him on earlier this year. Um, he said a ton of rain on my home lakes that time of year means two things. Backs of creeks get really good a few days after the rain, and anything from crankbaits, lipless baits, to chatterbaits and top waters work the best. The deal I really love when we get a ton of rain is the deep bite. It causes a lot of current, and they will get schooled up really good, just like they would in May and June. Alabama rigs, big spoons, deep crankbaits, and pretty much all the typical offshore baits play. Most of the time, I will use the schools of fish to get my limit, and hopefully some nice ones, but then start running creeks to try and catch a big one or two. So that's 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 another detailed game plan. Thank yeah. you, Nick. First time we've heard the Alabama rig pop up. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, Ish Monroe. Uh, Talk to us, Ish. 
he's going straight to where the in, incoming water is, and he's slinging a spinner bait, covering water. Gonna pick up his bling spinner bait and 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 roll just just the way uh, Patrick said. All right, Edwin Evers. Edwin said, uh, "I'm going to run to the back of the creeks and pockets and catch them on a spinner bait where the new water meets the old water." So new rainwater run in meets the old lake water, if that yeah. makes sense. So he's going right at that point, right where it comes together. That's interesting because I uh, Mark Davis won a tournament on Table Rock and, uh, that I fished in, and, and he was following that 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 line, and it changed every hmm. day as that that intersection line moved down the lake. That was uh, my answer. Wow. Is that right, uh -huh. GDP? around here yeah that's it very very cool that's it yeah I, i'm loving hearing from these guys because everybody's a little like there's a lot of same but little different going on mm -hmm. you know and so to me that has me wondering like man this is a changing this is a changing scenario like each day one of these guys is going to be on the the goods correct um and edwin's answer was is was unique but but also not unique. I think somebody might have said that too. Anyways, John Cruz, this is a little different. He said he's going to take a fat John square bill and he's going to go up as far, far up into where the fresh water is flowing in. Way past to where it meets the old water. He's going to go up as far as he can get his boat. He said, if it doesn't work, I'm going to go back to where the new water meets the old water and throw a top water a walking bait or a buzz bait. So his was kind of two pronged approach. He was going to try to get up into the flow as far back as he could. And then if it doesn't work, go back to what kind of Edwin said and just he's a top water guy. I like it. Good stuff. Um, yep. Two more. Uh, Fred Rambanis. He said, being that I live here on uh, Lake Dardanelle, the rain in the middle of the fall means current the first day. And he'd stay on the main river banks and roll a spinnerbait. He said the second day of the rain, he'd try it early, but adjust quickly if they don't bite and run to an area with a reverse pocket. You know, a lot of mud. Sheltered from the up. muddy flow. That's a good answer. Exactly. With a reverse pocket and throw a frog or buzz bait mixed, mixed with flipping. So he's going to go to top water and mix, followed up with a flipping bait. Said the water will remain somewhat clean and the fish will be active. He said lots of rain can blow out the river quickly up there. So being willing to adjust is key. Great answers yeah. we're getting, guys. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. So last but not least, um, Iconelli's answer, I think, is probably more broad. Um, he said that particular time in most parts of the country, coincides with the fall feed bass will be super bait oriented and already set up on the flats the shoals the pockets and the creeks he said the fresh rain in a creek that has a drain or a draw in the back usually only makes things better the bait almost always will head further back toward the fresh cooler run in and the bass will follow depending on water clarity how muddy it is my top choices would change a little bit, but in general, spinnerbait, chatterbait, top water, buzzbait, and a fluke would be his first choices. Of course, you know he had to throw four or five rods out there first. <laughs> yeah, just some awesome, awesome answers. Uh, you know, rewind it back. You'll 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 find some. Hope hope you guys can find some goods for your local lakes because some of you are going to get that scenario this fall where the rain totally changes things up. Well, that's great stuff. And uh, I, GDP, what, what, what's your answer? So what's I'm, your solution? I'm talking South Jersey. Yeah. It's, it's local. Um, so our lakes are anywhere from 50 to 100 acres, where if you get a big rain within a day or two, sometimes it just completely wipes the lake out mud-wise. Can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have seen, too, in the fall, you know, around here, that's that's the corralling time of year where the fish are on the bait. They're pushing contours, what we have in three, four feet of water. They still use that contour. But I've seen where that mud can come down. I can pick, like, three lakes off the top of my head where I've seen this. Davis, Elmer, and Rainbow. 
uh, where that mud comes down and them fish that were corralling the bait on the contours, they actually use that mud line coming and push them right, right into it. Um, I would throw a rattle trap a lot. That's how I catch a lot of them fish. Uh, usually white, you know, sexy shad color. Uh, but I've also seen to where or seen where it can be overwhelming, and I've got a really good on the bank on a buzz bait in that mud. Right. So they're my two answers. Good stuff. Yeah. I got. I got to say, like the open that we just fished had this event. Like we it had did. two inches of rain um, that took place, and I've got to be honest. I was going to be a creek angler in this tournament, and um, that's where I wanted to be uh, at least part of my time. And that two inches of rain, it it altered the whole system. It pushed the bait out, pushed the predators out, and the tournament was won off of Edwin's kind of intersection yep. where that fresh runoff met yeah. the main body of water. That's where our tournament was won. Uh, it describes it exactly. And, uh, you know, I was surprised, like, uh, every day I checked the creek pattern uh, throughout all three days because I know that as conditions stabilize – that, is, that bait will reposition itself to predators, will come right back in, and when that happens, you're seeing the fresh movement, and it can be lights out. But never happened during the tournament. But uh, I, I also feel like, even though it was the springtime, when Edwin won at Grand Lake for the Classic, I think it was the same scenario. He went uh, up to yeah. a flat that intersected with the creek, and he got them all on the flat on isolated cover. But I think there was rain. Right. Uh, even though it was springtime, it was still kind of the same deal. Fish using that yep. mix. Yeah. You know, you know, interesting stuff, man. Great list, J.K. Thanks yeah. for bringing that. Yeah, what's learned what's a Riz, lot. What's Riz? Yeah, you have something, Riz. Uh, am I, am I my turn now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, on the I guess, spot. Buddy. I guess we'll go go with the bay, and I put some thought to it. Yeah. Um, that at that time of year, it's kind of still like um, they're not all where they're gonna be yet, but they're definitely moving and they can kind of seem like they're still a little bit everywhere. So what I'm, how I'm going to approach that is I'm going to, I'm going to focus on, you know, all the highest percentage areas for, you know, for, for where I think I can get bites in that time of year. And I'm going to look for the water clarity that I want to fish, right? I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be the super clean. I don't want it to be blown out mud. I want it to be that nice mix. Um, and whichever one of those, you know, high percentage areas, Seems like it has the most life, most bait. That's how I'm going to approach it. And as far as baits go, um, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go two different. I'm gonna go two routes. Um, I'm gonna keep the chatter bait in hand. You know, that's the confidence bait. And depending on you know what kind of habitat you know I'm fishing, the other bait would be a flipping bait, probably quarter ounce with a lot of appendages on it. Something that's gonna fall slow, move a lot of water, and that slightly stained stuff. A um, little bit bigger profile uh, to get those more active fish that are feeding, um, to, to, to want to, to want to eat. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on, you know, the areas of the body of water where I think should hold fish for the time of the year. And then I'm going to look for the water clarity that, that I think is, is best to be able to trigger the fish to bite. So I'm, I'm shocked that in Riz's solution, it involved the chatterbait, aren't you? <laughs> I'm so shocked. <sorry. laughs> it's got. I got <laughs> into that as he was giving the answer. Like he's looking for chatterbait water. Yeah, you know, where yeah. they need a chatterbait that, water. That's it. Yeah. Forget about the conditions. I'm just running around till I yeah. find fish that bite a chatterbait. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. That's Pretty like much. that's like uh, Uncle Freddy Rum Band. It's the same thing. I was surprised he listed a frog as one of his solutions <laughs> to to you know his problem solving. But uh, it's great stuff, man. Great great yeah. list. Uh, great feedback from the panel and everybody and uh it's really cool i want to remind everybody if you're watching on facebook now's time like us share us and we're going to be picking a winner here momentarily um and uh josh are there any uh, ims on uh our uh, fall um solutions not really i mean some everyone was just coming up the creek or up the creek yeah, yeah. so yeah. not really okay well the horny toad. The horny toad. Put that mm. on like a. That is a terrible a name. Found. <laughs> I know, but it, it's terrible. my favorite. You know, <laughs> match the uh, color to conditions. It's muddy. You can, you know, yep. go black or it's clear up. Use the white. And go shallow. Scott's weighing in with the the frog man. Surprisingly, yeah. right. picking a frog. Go with the horny to, toad. Uh, <laughs> Gotta love that bait. <laughs> the, uh, so, so, Rose is a chatterbait. You're a frog man. You're a black psycho. What am I? <laughs> 
What's my bait? Your drop bait. shot. Buzz that should put me on drop shot. Your drop shot. Nah, man. I don't. I don't. Let's make drop bait. shot what, what when I make GDP. I, I got you. I'll, I'll give you the top, top, middle, bottom. I'll go for <laughs> for for top for top water. You're a buzz bait. Dang. Uh, Dang. Middle. You know. I mean, we can all throw moving baits. We can all wind, but you know, I, I know you have some spinner bait, some spinner bait stuff in your arsenal. Mm. Um, and on the bottom, your your jig. I'm gonna say you're right on two of them. Okay. On the middle, I'm gonna say a rattle trap. Oh, uh, you know what? Ooh, yeah, I should. I, I can do that. I can Come hover. On. I can hover that thing with the best of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I knew that's that. a sweet bait. You know, I, you know I just, crazy. I well, used to hate a rattle trap. Me too. Wow. I still I do. Never actually, get a bite on it. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, come on. <laughs> what, you know? That's the, I I love what? that I love that bike too, but it's funny because whenever I think of you, I like it seems like the drop shot's always a solution in a in uh, a big tournament scenario. Yeah. I would say that's always on my front deck for sure. Yeah. Um. But if we're speaking locally, the three that you know we just talked about. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That changes on winning tournaments for me. Changes things a little bit. Well, do you, how do we want to do this? We want to ask the question and then do the Facebook like and share giveaway. Yeah, yeah we'll ask the question, give them yes. some time to cue right. the answers through. Um, so the grand prize trivia question is going to be: What was Hunter Ballman's winning setup uh, in the Toyota Series that he just won on Truman Lake? What was Hunter Ballman's winning setup? Uh, we need to know uh, rod, uh, rod length, action, and uh, what his bait was. <laughs> rod length action and winning bait because yeah, uh you know to me there was there was just a little bit unusual mm -hmm. um exactly. what what his uh selection was in that regard but um but yeah i love the lipless bait too gdp yep. i mean i've been uh i've been i fell in love with that uh fishing the potomac river um the first time i ever fished it was in in a fishing club and uh we went went down to, <laughs> Uh, in the 80s, I'm embarrassed to say, in the 80s, went down there, caught 100 bass wow. on a quarter ounce. It was a rattle trap, the original rattle trap, chrome and blue. Mm. I caught 100 bass. I don't think I caught 100 bass in my lifetime up until that day. Mm. Wow. And that day, uh, I caught 100 bass on it. And uh, that's just that's how good the Potomac was, continues to be. Yep. You know? Yep. It's just, uh, it's just an amazing fishing. But I love the lipless bite, man. So do I. Been in love with it ever since then. GDP, do yep. you know the? It was on. It was unveiled on Bash U. I don't know how much video that got traction out in the public, but the four wheel drive trick with the lipless. Yeah, with the grass shot like with Mark Daniels. Stuff. Mark Daniels Jr. Mm. on the Delaware River fishing a blow down trees with uh, really? with the lipless. Huh. You take you take the back hook off. And the thing comes through. I, I've only experienced it once, huh. and I can't wait to do it again. But on West Point Lake, I got in. I got on the back of a creek in the fall, and started banging it into stumps, and it would come over. You know, the thing yep. would just. It was using the regular Bill Lewis. That one honestly performed really good. The way it runs, it protects the hook. Uh huh. It works, and, they were and of course, it, Pete huh? got the front row seat. He produced that video. Yeah, I, I, I was sitting there watching him do this, and I'm like, you, the, the one thing everybody knows is you can't throw a lipless anywhere near a piece of wood. Yeah, it's just, it's like a magnet. It's just going to stick right to it, and he just removed the rear hook, which limits your, you know, strike to catch maybe a little bit, but threw it in one of the most complicated blowdowns that you'll ever see. You know, just full of branches and cone, yeah. pine cones, and and just watching them walk that uh, yep. lipless bait right over the branches. It's a it, you check it out. It's MDJ on uh, a lipless cranking on Bashy TV. It's like yeah. I need, need a new box. Isn't it amazing? Like how like you, you get somebody that just has so much confidence in one bait, and they're like, "Yeah, I can fish that through a tree." What yeah. do you mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it's just wild, you know. It, it really is. By the way, if you haven't subscribed, go do it. It's uh, three months, thirty four ninety nine. We give you a twenty five dollar tackle direct coupon. Uh, you're going to love uh, Tackle Direct after you place your for first order. You're going to love those guys. So go check that out. Get yourself subscribed. We have a winner? We sure do. CJC1 with the answer. That would be a 7-8 <laughs> heavy action Denali rod with... 7-8? Yep. With uh, a three-quarter ounce football jig. Boom. Well, well done. Boom. Congratulations. And we have a Facebook like and share? 
We sure do. Mike Cutler, you won. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, JK, thank, thanks for being with us, man. We look forward to having you uh, back again soon. Hey, anytime, guys. Love it. Love doing the pros panel and uh, coming back. Coming back to the family. Uh, it's great to have you back, and, uh, you know, maybe next time Kat can come on and uh, give us some tile floor uh, <laughs> samples or something. Uh, if you guys want any of that, just go to Kimmel Design. It's a totally different world over there, but but you can you can go see that on her Instagram if you're in, interested in that stuff. Uh, I, I suspect a lot are. Um, I want to thank Hunter for being with us today. What an what a amazing win. Congratulations again, Hunter Bogman. And uh, it was awesome to, to have you and hear that story. Wish you best of luck in the rest of the season. You too, JK, at the MPFL down in Florida. We'll be watching. And we are going to be back next week with another uh, episode of Bash You Live. So we will see you next Tuesday at 11 o'clock. And uh, thanks, everybody. GDP, yeah. thanks oh, yeah. for being here. Joss, Riz, Scott, okay. ho hope you guys have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next time.